<coughs> I hope that you will stay, all of you. But if you have to leave, uh, I would invite you to take a copy of the flyer and uh, please spread the word. I don't have $150 million to budget it. It is by word of mouth that uh, this will be offered online next semester and it can be taken by anyone, scholars, students, common people, uh, believers, agnostics, atheists, all are welcome. Okay, so I would like to begin with the vision of our late brother, Sayyid Rifat Mahmood, that I mentioned earlier. When he, was, he became president of uh, United Muslims of America, he had experience in politics, and he was concerned that the American Muslims are not having their fair share in politics. They don't have any political clout. So he came up with this plan. So I would like to share with you some of the high points of the plan. Okay. So he mentions what is the mission. United Muslims of America, uh, they are to bring social, economic, cultural, and civic empowerment for Muslims in the US through the political process. And number two, to ensure that the American Muslim community believes in the economic, social, and political Islamic and American values of justice for all, regardless of their color, race, or religion. And the plan that he had consisted of these steps. Number one, register to vote. He had the vision that we should have a slate of one million voters. And when we go to a congressman or a senator who is running for election, we would say, we have one million voters. But this is what, I, what we want you to do for us. And that is how the power can be acquired, how a voice can be acquired. Number one was that. The second, United Muslims of America is going to prepare a database of Muslim voters um, using the most sophisticated software called the big data. And so they will collect all the information and that will be our number one source of political clout. And the next one is train and groom our younger generation to become future leaders, like Elena here and other youngsters in our community. Volunteer your time for local, state, and national election campaigns. Time, you have to really volunteer because without that, nothing can be done. Encourage Muslim lawyers to challenge anti-Muslim groups in the courts of law. I'm so happy to see that uh, Muslim Advocates Group is doing just that. They are doing a great job, a group of lawyers. Not all of them are Muslims. I know some of them personally, they are Hindus, but they are all of that same consortium and they are working to extricate Muslims from difficult situations. One last item that he had, which was a bit controversial uh, because it was impractical, was to have an office in Washington, D.C. so we can have interaction with the congressional leaders on a daily basis. The funding was not there. That was the main problem. So when I said earlier that um, uh, last evening I met this um, inventor, Mir Imran, and after meeting him, I kept thinking, what can we do? Because he had a, he is the holder of hundreds of patents. Mir Imran, he has a lot of labs. He's the inventor of the pill 
that replaces the injection. Number two, he's the inventor of the screening process at the airports because he said he found a problem. As a scientist, he focused on it. He framed the problem and he went for the solution. So this book has framed the problem beautifully. And what can we do to take the next step? Solution. So that's where we, all of us are here. And I will uh, stop and invite you all to please take part in it. And this microphone is there. And, Hello? Yeah, we can hear you. Um, so, yeah, uh, I was talking to Tashi Uncle the other day, and we were discussing how to get our young people involved. Um, and I did a lot of thinking about this. I feel like, um, especially as a first generation um, immigrant, um, we have a completely different idea of um, how to approach things. And that perspective is very important. And I think you should impart that perspective on your children. They should know that perspective. But at the same time, you have to sort of understand where they're coming from as well. In order to get any actual dialogue going, you need to understand each other's context. You have to understand each other's, um, like Dashi Uncle was saying, he doesn't know what it's like to be raised in a high school here in America, right? Um, and I think getting a nice clear dialogue going is very important important um i don't know if uh, how many of you have toddlers or have had toddlers but um if you tell not a toddler but like a young child maybe five or six if you tell them no sometimes they ask why right so if they're gonna say why and you just say oh because i said so they're gonna continue asking why 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 and until they get tired or until you get tired say go to your room you have to answer that why you have to give them context, you have to give them some more credit, especially with your older children, give them some more credit that they can understand where you're coming from if you just break it down for them. And you should do the same to them. You should try to see where they're coming from. Um, so that, that's just a start though, obviously. That's how we can get a dialogue going, a discussion going, because a lot of uh, youngsters here believe, oh, I'm so much more progressive thinking than my parents are, they're so backwards, which isn't not, not necessarily true, right? It's just that there's a disconnect there. We have the same kind of values, but we need to come from a place of more understanding. And from there, we can actually start talking about what we can do. Um, and uh, yeah, so if uh, we can get that dialogue going, we can get more people understanding, we can encourage other parents to get that dialogue going. Um, with their children, with um, with uh, in our communities as a whole, um, and I think that's a good first step. Um, yeah. Yes. Most of the doesn't come here. Not to the family that So, uh, sorry, thank you, sir. Most of the youth, I don't see them coming to the Chandni programs because these are mostly for the adults. Yes. Uh, so, how do we get to them? How do we get to your generation and above and below, people <laughs> that are a little bit older, a little bit younger? Yeah. Uh, that, that's an important question because I've been trying very hard uh, for many years, but not successfully. So can you guide us, help us? How do we do that? I mean, um, I'd like to think I'm a voice of my generation, but <laughs> um, obviously every chat's going to be different, have a different circumstance. But I think it is important to, again, I feel like that getting that dialogue going will encourage them more. You just have having that communication with children and around children. Um, and so what I understand from yeah. that is what I was saying earlier, that the first dialogue or the only dialogue we can have is with our children. Yes. But someone of my age, even his children are gone away and here and there. So maybe have a dialogue with grandchildren. Yes. Maybe <laughs> meet them. But other than that, the youth in colleges, in uh, universities, here and there, yeah. is there a way to connect with them? What can we do? What type of things can we do to attract that generation to come and maybe give us an opportunity to sit with them and try to find out and have a dialogue? That's what I was... 
yeah, to get them there to yeah sit down. That's true. Um, that is a tough one. That is a tough one. I know offering college credit can help a lot of people. Yeah, um, a, a lot of uh, young people, especially in this area. But what are they? What are they involved in? What What are they spending their time on? They're trying to you know make a place in their life. There's so much pressure. I don't think a lot of people realize how much pressure there is from all sides on youngsters today to. Uh, I mean, it's not just good grades at school. Obviously, there's extracurriculars. There's all these different tests. There's all these different. Um, you need three years of job experience just to go into a certain field, and uh, it, a lot of people don't realize that it, there's a lot more going on than there was, say, 20, 30 years ago, or even 10 years ago. Um, and uh, so you need to make it accessible, I'd say. Make it accessible, maybe online. Online, on, I, I think uh, having an online discussion group, social media is wonderful, a wonderful tool. Um, obviously, if used properly, right? Because that can go wrong too. But um, yeah, it's a wonderful tool. We, um, like our, Skype class, actually, we, um, that, I thought that was wonderful. That's very accessible, especially for college students, especially for people who are traveling. Um, I think more things like that could potentially bring more people in, flexible hours. Um, I, and I understand that this should be a priority, but sometimes, uh, you know, people, when they have school, when they're trying to establish their lives, that can get in the way. That can be, I mean, obviously that's more of an urgent thing a lot of the times, jobs, school. Um, but uh, yeah, no, uh, I think accessibility is probably one of the biggest ones. Yeah. Yes. I was just thinking maybe through voting is something which we should encourage everyone. And oh, sorry. Uh, so like voting is important to all of us and maybe creating something in an environment of, uh, where the youth is invited and have some speakers like Tashi Bhai and others who are who have uh, capabilities of talking to them uh, and to like show them how they can be involved themselves um, and it doesn't have to be that ad adults like us have to be there but we could be just a starting point of guiding them on how to organize themselves within the community and then reaching out to the other communities so I think voting might be one way of going about it and showing them that this is their way to achievement also. No, I, I agree a lot. And again, um, to encourage things like voting, social media does come into play. I don't know if you've noticed the last election, um, according to a lot of uh, polls that I read, um, we've had more of a um, young voter turnout uh, than any other midterm election that we've known of in recent history, at least. Um, and that's, that's, a lot of it has to do with how much we've been promoting, go vote, your voice matters. And the more we encourage kin kids telling them there's hope, there's a chance that you can actually make change and that your voice does matter, especially with social media, someone who comes from nothing, they can, the whole world can see what's going on in their lives and the situation they're in. Um, because we have these tools now. And I think that's amazing that people from poverty, children from poverty, they can show people, they can show the world what's going on directly. They don't have to have money a lot of times. I mean, no, internet connection and maybe some source. But um, there's so many sources and things available, tools available for to give voice to the voiceless now. And I, I think that's revolutionary. And I think that also helps to encourage young children who feel like, powerless in this sort of situation. I feel like, especially when um, we're this age and we don't have that much money, we don't have that much influence, we need some sort of power. We need to feel empowered. And I feel like until we, like, as if children don't feel empowered, they're not gonna want to make, it's not that they don't want to make change. They just don't think that they can. So that is important to encourage them, tell them this does make a difference and your voice does matter. It's not something that will be ignored. You can make a change. Don't keep telling them depressing things like nothing is gonna happen. You just have to live with it. I'll leave it to God. I mean, obviously God's taking care of us, but we have to take care of ourselves too, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. sorry. Yes. So one more thing, like, I think like with your point with uh, saying that like, empowering the youth is very important because there was one thing where President Trump said that it doesn't really matter what 
the youth think about gun laws, right? And uh, I don't know if you guys know about Trevor Noah, but he's one of my favorite like uh, public speakers. So he actually said that if the children are being shot, then there should be an opinion about how to be shot and what to be. So empowering your youth is like one of the major things. Like that's like head on, that's like full on 100%, we should be full throttle with that. And then also letting the youth know that they're like Islamic organizations that are like being involved in all of these things like CARE, Islamic Relief, all of these other type of organizations that are actually being like actively involved in this. If children just spend like at least an hour to like in a month to volunteer for an organization event, it'll be enough to like change their minds. You know, about anything that happens globally, locally, they'll come to more events and next thing you know, they'll be like future leaders even, inshallah, you know? So it's very... Get more people. Definitely. I'm always for you, anything, sir. <laughs> Yes, let's get more young people here. And Ali's son may have something to say. Yes. Well, I'm not sure if I, <clears throat> sorry, that I qualify as a young person anymore, like you two <laughs> find the... Uh, uh, your connection between me and her because you're in the middle. I'm stuck in the middle. For me, you're young. No, I, I think you guys have hit it uh, on the nail perfectly. Better now? <clears throat> okay, good. Um, no, you guys have hit it uh, on, on the nail uh, perfectly, but we need to see you guys more often. Um, and bring uh, 10 of you guys along with you, right? Um, and be involved. Um, everything you said is point on. Um, I, I don't know if I want to add anything else. I don't want to clap whatever you guys said. Um, but if you, if you have any, anyone else. Tashimai, youth ko involve karne mein hum parents ki bhi sab se badi zimmedari hai. Jab hum apne bachho ko leke in choti choti jigaon pe volunteer karenge, masjid hai, care hai, open hai, to wo jab jo jo involve honge, they will come forward. Jab tak hum push back nahi karenge, youth to youth hi hai. Youth youth hi hai. To isme hume, hume chahiye hum inko motivate karein. This is a main... Um, yeah, parents' duty. And I you for doing that. Yeah, I did to my son, that's why. Practical example. <laughs> yes. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, Professor Jabbar, I have uh, a specific question actually when you were mentioning. Number one was that that we are a part of some sort of a propaganda and uh, likewise your minds have been hijacked somehow. Okay. Do you speak into the microphone? Yes. So when you were speaking, uh, you were telling about actually the hijacking of the minds. Like why is actually your voice has gone up, uh, your voice is meaning somebody is defining you. Mm. Okay. And the citations which you gave up was on the same thought process, which was uh, uh, somewhere in 1948, actually, right. and then it came up in 2004. Okay, mm -hmm. with a specific reference of, to Mr. Ghazali's also, that he also said up in his book, actually, after 19, sorry, 9-11, uh, uh, the word Islam is being related to terrorism. Now, my question here is, if in case we know there is a propaganda, so what's the solution for it? Okay, well, how can you counter a propaganda? Okay, when you feel that actually your voice is no longer there and has been taken up. So the, I'm specifically ans asking you for a solution relating to this one. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, I wish I had a simple solution, but uh, you know the work that Ghazali Saab has done already in documenting in a book which is publicly available, that is a step in the direction. And then we have to publicize the book. Because the book is published, it can just gather dust on a shelf. So it is our job, after an author has done his job, to publicize the book, go on local channels, talk about the book. 
and then talk about the courses that I have designed, I'm teaching. People who only who take the classes know about it. Others don't, so I can reach maybe 100 people at the most, but that is not going to do it. So I think there's a, a real battle is in publicizing, and we don't have the budget. As I mentioned, our opponents who really want to misrepresent us have a budget of 150 million plus with seven organizations. Their full-time job is to just portray Muslims as terrorists, as, a, as troublemakers and all that. So we have very small clout compared with them. But whatever we have, we have to use it wisely. I mentioned earlier that I felt very powerless as a professor at a school, the biggest college in the country, 100,000 students, no course on Islam. And people had the same views which they got from the media. They don't have time to research. They just are fed some information by the media. They absorb it, and they say, oh, that's, they have the truth. So when I got so fed up with that, I spent about 100 hours of my time on my own, created a course outline, which I had to present before 25 experts who question, why are you making a course outline on religion? Is the purpose to proselytize? What is the purpose? So I had to defend it in front of those 25. It was passed. And I started teaching it. Luckily, now I have three other professors who are teaching the same class every semester. But this semester, I put in my wife can probably witness a lot of time, about a month, last month, to make this class online. So I can reach to reach more people. Anybody, anywhere in the world can take the class. But how will they know? I have to reach out and tell people this course is available online, open to anyone, and please think about signing up. So I think we have to maximize our outreach through publicizing. So, so I the, think that's what my answer would be. Yeah, the solution which you are offering is uh, for the propaganda, it has to be a counter-propaganda? Uh, and a, we have a limitation on, I would on the call resources? It, uh, it, I will call it correction of the falsehood with verifiable facts. Because the propaganda doesn't really base itself on facts. As Orientalism, what is Orientalism, which mm -hmm. Edward Say talked about? It is not just uh, bias, mm -hmm. which will be fine. I wouldn't have any problem. It is a constructed mechanism which is put together with care and then fed. So that is propaganda, but not based on facts. Mm -hmm. Edward Say shows in his book, Orientalism, mm -hmm that the presentation of Muslim Middle East Islam in 18th century was the same that was the 19th century and the 20th century, which shows that Muslims are stagnant. They have never evolved. They're, you know, so he says that is all manufactured platform. We can dismantle it only with verifiable facts. Mm -hmm. So that's the difference between propaganda and our approach. So we, we are a victim of uh, false propaganda. That's exactly. Okay. Uh, microphone to uh, Sister Mariam. Sabse pehle to Pazali sahab, congratulations to you for writing such a comprehensive book. I mean, it's real. It's a dry subject. But I have, I would not say that I have read the whole thing, but I have read the half. It's a very, very comprehensive from the distribution and uh, and the accumulation of the wealth as such. This book is about how the, the wealth was accumulated from the 10% to 4% and how it is affecting the whole thing. So congratulations for collecting this uh, very dry subject and giving us such a comprehensive and detailed uh, analysis of this. I have a question for you. I know you have answered some like what promoted to write you on such a dry subject. And my second thing is you have answered some, but we need a little bit more clarification. And where can we use this data that you have put in this book? Where is being this used today? 
So if you could answer that. And congratulations again. Thank you very much. Well, it is a sort of reference book. And uh, uh, answer to your question is that, well, if books or data like this is promoted by, the, by Muslims, so it can be used anywhere. See, it can be used to, and, and uh, for your information, this book is published by Amazon and it is also available on internet, see. So this is actually a story of Muslims by Muslims, see. And as Mr. Jamal Qureshi uh, was thinking that, well, it is a counter propaganda, well, in some way, it is a counter-propaganda, just to uh, give reply to those people, answer to those people who are, uh, who are uh, propagating against uh, uh, not only Muslims, but also the Muslim faith, Islam, see. This is actually, uh, well, it is a long story, but uh, after 9-11, you see, it got more speed, see. So we have uh, dozens of uh, so-called uh, Islamic experts who are all non-Muslim, and their only objective is just to uh, give a negative image of Muslims. And usually it is a negative uh, image of Muslims and uh, a Muslim society, not in America. It is about the Muslim countries, but it definitely affects us. See, so this is the whole story. See, I hope I'm able to answer your question. We tend to blame West for all our, whatever is happening in the Muslim world, we just tend to blame West. And we are not taking any responsibility as such, like we have such a whole block of Saudi Arabia. I mean, you know, B billions of dollars have been used there, and where are those money going to? So why, as a Muslim Ummah, why do not we have a collective voice against Saudi Arabia? Why are we so scared to talk about Saudi Arabia? Please, this is one reason that we are so backward, and we are so, like, radical and, you know, terrorist. I think, uh, I think, yeah. uh, uh, well, the answer to this question is that well, as I mentioned in my book also, and this story is told by other, other writers, that, well, there was colonialism in the 19th century, 18th century, 19th century, and it ended by the middle of 20th century. Now, the policy during this period of 100, 200 years, the West evolved a system through which they control global political and economic system. Now they don't need, they now they don't need uh, direct rule in other countries just as they did during the colonial period. Now they rule the rulers, see? And it applies to Saudi Arabia and all Muslim leaders, see? Oh, so we, we, we cannot blame only the Muslim, uh, the, the Saudi, Saudis. Uh, I mean, no country can come close when you're talking about Islam than Saudi Arabia, unfortunately. So that is our main block. Well, well, Whatever the fatwas are coming from there, they have been implemented in the madrasas, and we follow no, them. No, no, madrasa is another story. Yeah, and and Mr. Jamal Qureshi wants to add something to it. Yeah, definitely, because I'd like to take part in this. <laughs> Let me tell you about actually wha what makes you to refer up for Saudi Arabia. Uh, that you, uh, uh, I, I, am, I like to understand. I should make a thought for clarity. What makes you? Sorry, what makes you to think about uh, that Saudis are the bad people? Yes, well, I'm not that. Sorry. But I do. I do differ with the Saudi uh, policies. I do differ them with passion, because all the fatwas are coming. I mean, we are not talking about right. Of course, we, are, we have a little deviated from the subject, like how the West has been using um, 
the Islam versus, so right now in Muslim Ummah, everything that's come from Saudi Arabia and from the clergy is taken as the most authentic words. Nobody is there, and people are not understanding, the Muslim Ummah in common do not understand the difference between the royalty and the clergy. Right now, we do not even want to say a, a word against the royalty, thinking that we are talking about the Islamic. You see, so this is this is the main thing we have here, and that's what I think. When I right now, the billions of dollars that are being used by the Trumps are being used on Germany's. So I mean, right now, why we not talk about it? Why have why we tend to feel so shy to talk about Saudi Arabia's role in Muslim world? How many times you have been to Saudi Arabia, ma'am? Three times. Three times. Okay, uh, uh, in, uh, uh, what was the purpose of your visit? Well, why do you want to ask me? I'm just... I'm, I'm yeah, I'll tell you about the clarity uh, to make the thoughts about it. I, uh, see, one. No, no, I'm not interrogating here. No, do yeah. not ask me my question. I've been there many times. Well, let me answer. And I visited yeah. many other yeah. places. Okay, so... Jamal Sahib, if you could just please uh, give us your mind. Yeah, I'll, I'll give that you That will mind. be appreciated. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Well, first of all, actually, let me tell you about which we going up onto the main subject line, actually, on the talking of the world, the things of propaganda. I also think that actually this is a part of a propaganda also. But yes, the last 25, 30 years, I'm traveling to Saudi Arabia. I do a major business on, on this one. Okay, the fatwas and other thing talking, actually, I don't think so. It's going on for this. Uh, Saudi Arabia has developed him uh, itself. Actually, there are more than uh, every year, actually, uh, a new school has been opened in Saudi Arabia. Their universities, actually, like the King Saud and King Faisal universities, they all they have of their own engineers. About 4,000 scientists actually are there. So entire Aramco and Sabek has been managed by Saudi Arabia. So Saudi Arabia is not like this one that they don't know uh, anything about it and they are uh, riding on camels. Now coming to the main point actually for the part of the propaganda. Okay, I as a Muslim, I have been born up in India. Okay, and I have faced up these things from my school. The first thing is this, that the Muslims do not take bath. They take up once in a week. Okay. Uh, that was also asked in my class, actually. Uh, we are the dirtiest people uh, um, uh, in India, okay, particularly, and uh, uh, we have got a lot of many children, actually. That's what we wear. Okay, this is what actually I've seen up in my school, actually. And uh, the woman uh, all the time actually has been suppressed, actually. So from, from where these thoughts were coming on, likewise, actually, just now you say, there are people actually sitting here, sitting, they have the budget and this one, and that they have to release up this, this propaganda. And we do not have anything like this one to counter that propaganda. So, uh, this is what exactly I was saying, that actually uh, there has to be some sort of thing like actually to counter that propaganda uh, uh, in order to diffuse this thing. Otherwise, actually, people believe actually we, likewise, I don't take a bath actually. But would you suggest as a means to counter the propaganda? Correct. To, to collect funds, but how? If you can yeah, ask. see, the thing is like if I have to uh, tell you about it, I have to tell you specific facts about like the lady who was talking about Saudi Arabia. You know, I took up from my, one of my people here actually, they also had an impression. Bill Mount actually, he is the vice president of the United States gun lobby. I took him to Saudi Arabia to say, come on and see myself actually. At, in the night at 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, I woke him up and I said, come on actually. And we walked up on the streets of Jeddah in the night and I said that actually how safe you are. So there are good and positive things about this one that we are not saying about it. Yeah, um, uh, thank you for your comment. If I could add something. Um, sure. Yeah, if I could add something. I think, uh, I think what people need to understand too is that uh, critic certain criticisms aren't necessarily taking away from the positives. You, I think uh, all we should really be looking for is what's true, what's fact, and just uh, and try to separate them. I mean, obviously, we have, even here in the U.S., we obviously have a very orientalistic view of our own home countries or other Muslim countries. In actually, I've noticed quite a few uh, views of this, uh, views like these are particularly of countries you don't hail from. You're talking about other Muslim countries out when you have no idea what's going on there. You don't live there. You don't grow up there. And I understand criticisms. It's 
fine to criticize, but you have to understand the context. There's always context involved. There's always um, things that we are missing, blanks that we need to fill in. So I, it's fine to criticize, but I think we need to have a more, we need to have more understanding overall just of what's going on. And I feel like um, your book does a great job of trying to start unraveling that. So yeah. I, yeah. Any other comments? I yes. just want to very briefly refer back to empowering the youth. Mm -hmm. And I want to ask you, Elena, yes. if it will be a good idea for us to pass the burden of our conversation today to the youth and ask them to please come up with a solution instead of instilling any ideas in them. I, I think it because it's not that uh, the older generation is gone. We're, we shouldn't treat you like you're gone. I feel like, uh, every, again, it has to do with context. We have to know history to be able to change anything. And if we're just going to ignore everything from the past, we're not going to be able to change anything. So I feel like it needs to be a cooperative effort. We both need to work together. Yeah. It's not that we one side imparts knowledge on the other. It should be. It should go both ways. We can yeah. give the youth the book, Rosalisa's book. Yes. So that gives all the information. Yes. And it is framed. The question problem is framed beautifully. Yes. Yes. And definitely. the solution has to come from the youth. You know, why? No. Why not? They they are capable of coming up with something. Probably more innovative than our solution. I, I, I think part of it all is also, which um, that I, I'm not saying is a, a normal thing amongst the culture as a whole, but we tend to disregard youth ideas and shut them down as like individuals, like your own kids sometimes, right? You wanna believe you're right. You think, okay, maybe they're coming from a good standpoint, but they don't really understand what's going on. So they're not giving us the right answers. That's why I feel like a it should be a collective effort mm -hmm. because I feel like, again, there's blanks that are missing. There are context is important. We need to see things from both sides to come up with a collective solution. I don't think if you just hand the problem to uh, children, they're not going to, or not children, but young adults, uh, they're not really going to understand every single thing. They're not going to really feel it the way you feel it. They're only going to feel what they feel, what's going on currently, but the past is very important. So that's why I think a collective uh, solution is more of a good, yeah. Thank you. Make a comment. Uh, uh, what Mariam was saying exactly is the problem that we shouldn't be afraid of criticizing any government that does something that Saudi government did in Turkey recently. Yes. Why, why are we afraid to speak up about that? Yes. I don't understand that. There should be no fear. I really feel very sorry for the Prime Minister of Pakistan, Imran Khan, whom we all supported, for being in that situation yeah. where he cannot condemn. At heart, he condemns it, but because he's trapped financially, he cannot. I really feel sorry for him. But what happened in Turkey made my job of teaching the course on Islam 100% more difficult. Okay, because my students ask me, well, we hold up Saudi Arabia as the arbiters of the Islamic world. They are the custodians of the holy shrines. And then their fatwas are law. Of course, I give them a very short answer. I just say, I condemn what they did. Anything like that is worthy of condemnation. But ask your government, don't ask me. Ask the US government, yes. why, what is their position about Saudi Arabia? Of the 19 hijackers, 16 were yes. from Saudi Arabia, and we went after Afghanistan, Iraq, destroyed mm -hmm. them. Saudi Arabia is totally unharmed. What's the policy? So I handle the student's question, but it makes my job very difficult. Yes. So mm -hmm. I think we really should not mince words Yes. When it comes to some brutal, blatant, yes. obscene kind of behavior as we witnessed in the Saudi government's execution of that journalist. Yes, yes. Thank you so much. I'll just add to that, that when I said look at ourselves, are we, are we really practicing Muslims? Yes. And again, by practicing, 
I don't talk about prayers. That to me is a very personal affair between you and the Creator. When I talk about being Muslim, is what does it mean to be a Muslim? And the things that come to my mind is speak the truth, even if it goes against you or your yes. loved ones. So that is what being a Muslim is about. And if you're afraid to speak the truth because something will happen, then I don't think we should consider ourselves Muslims. That's the first thing. If my son does something wrong, my wife will tell you that I'll be the first one to call the police and hand him over to the police for doing something wrong. Because I will not protect him. If he has done something wrong, then I have failed as a parent to raise him right and he need to face the consequence. Accountability. It's Accountability, very, absolutely. Yeah. And same thing for me. If I've done something wrong, I should be accountable for that. I think main thing, accountability has disappeared from the face of earth. We can do anything we please and there is no accountability. For 30 years, these people have sucked the blood of Pakistan. And who is accountable? Anybody who comes and who rules must be accountable. Yes. But we have become so insensitive to that. Even the people who were destroyed, whose families and generations will, were destroyed, they're still willing to vote for the same people. I don't understand that. Where does that come from? So things is that we need to, I think, in my humble opinion, our worst enemy is ignorance, illiteracy. We need to make sure and make every effort to bring people to literacy, at least to be able to read a newspaper. Our literacy rate in Pakistan is 15% today. It was the same in 1947. So what has changed? If anybody was sincerely interested, anybody who's helping Pakistan should place a condition, if they're sincere, that we will give you the next money if you raise your literacy rate. But that is not in their best interest. Again, I'm not the one who blames others. I'm the one who blames myself first and my community first. If we need to change, we need to change. Right from here, change starts from home. I need to Start change myself the man in the and our community will change. Sister Mariam, you want to say something? Yeah, I just wanted to say, as much as we are condemning uh, the Trump era, I think this is such a blessing in disguise for us because we have never seen so much of women emancipation before and we have never seen like the counter attack on the guns control before as it is and on the youths coming. So I think we should take, consider it as a, dis as a blessing and take the opportunity of rise and rise up, up and up. And Jabbar Sahib, thank you so much for you being here and giving us such an insight. And Tashi Sahib and Ghazali Sahib, thank you so much. I mean, it's really an honor to be among the Jews. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. If uh, there is no other comment, uh, I would first like to thank you all for making the time to be here and stay after the formal presentation. And I really was very inspired to hear all the comments and great ideas. And inshallah, we will try to implement them in the way they should be implemented. And we continue to count on your support. We cannot do without you guys here, especially the youth. Okay, so thank you very much again.